welcome back to the Primates with Reptiles podcast. I'm your host, Raph the Hominid. This is Ruby helping me out today, the Solomon Island ground boa. Ruby is here for a specific reason, for a little thought experiment that we are going to play a little bit later on in the show. Now, for today's topic. Perhaps you've heard this uh, two-word sequence, but the reptile brain, right? Think for a second. What does that mean to you when someone says the reptile brain? The idea of the reptile brain or the lizard brain was coined in the 1960s by Dr. Paul McLean. He was a neuroscientist. Now, this was used to describe the most basic part of our brain, right? The part of the brain that controlled our basic instincts, you know, survival things. Uh, we need to eat. We need to breathe and breed, really, to continue your species. Now, the problem with this is it kind of assumes something. And it assumes that mammals who would have the next part of the brain, the limbic system, right? The part that controls emotion. And then humans were the ones who developed this big prefrontal cortex, which is true, but we're definitely not the only ones. And what this theory has wrong is that it kind of assumes that it kind of went in order like that. Like first reptiles and then mammals came from reptiles and then humans came from the most complex of mammals, right? So to speak. So this idea of a, of a reptile brain or a lizard brain, brain, or a lizard brain living inside of our brain has a couple things wrong with it. We did not evolve from reptiles. As much as I wish I could say I am a close cousin of Ruby, I'm not. Sure, I do think all animals are of one thing. I mean, probably everything that's in this universe for one reason or another is part of the same thing. But we did not, or mammals, right? Mammals did not evolve directly from reptiles. We share common ancestors with reptiles, which are weird looking things from when, uh, you know, they kind of look like if a weasel and a lizard had a little baby, you know what I'm saying? Um, and these things went on to become, you know, one lineage went on to become reptiles, and one lineage became mammals. There's another problem, though, and, and this is kind of more specific to the idea of what the reptile brain is, if you're assuming that it is this very simplistic system that can only do basic functions. And that is that Reptiles have a prefrontal cortex, or maybe not the same way we do, but they have a cerebral cortex um, that does complex thought. What does that mean in reptiles? I don't know. I'm not inside Ruby's brain here. I have no idea exactly uh, how her thoughts work. But it's interesting that we thought that we had this complex part that they didn't, but they have the part. It's smaller. Uh, humans do have a pretty impressive brain. And that's okay, but I don't think that that means that reptiles are inherently these dumb things that a lot of people think that they are. Now, this idea of humans having this uh, advanced cerebral cortex and being more intelligent than other animals, which is what we're led to believe, I mean, in the media in general... But this is, this is kind of assuming a lot of things, right? Let me take a step back. When we think about animal intelligence, right? Something that people love is like a chimpanzee that can learn sign language. Okay. It's, it is impressive. How about dogs that learn to talk with, with buttons? I also think that's impressive. You know, the fact that dogs can have this complex like word association knowing like this sound means this thing. But when we're looking at intelligence in this way, we're kind of kind of blocked by like a language barrier, so to speak, right? Wow, we think that dog's really impressive because it could learn a couple simple English words or, you know, human words, whatever human language the dog is learning. But do, does a dog learning some of the English language, right? We'll just go with English. I'm speaking English. But... Does that dog learning a little bit of English and how impressed we are by that, and rightfully so, I mean, it is impressive, but does that take away from the, like, 
the language that dogs can speak by just like looking at each other, you know, and, and smelling each other. I think we need to be careful to not base animals' intelligence on if they can match our abilities in certain fields. Uh, same with the chimpanzee learning sign language. What about all the knowledge that they're clearly displaying, right? All the intelligence that animals are, I mean, I, I hate to say clearly because I suppose it's not so clear to some folks, but it's pretty clear to me that you know, animals have these weird abilities to to kind of interact with nature a lot better than we do, you know? Um, I have two cats as well, and kind of recently we had a, a mouse in the house. I mean, it happens. It's really cold here, so the mice want to get into warm places, and this is a warm place. But, you know, Rachel, my fiancé, and I are just kind of diddly-dallying, doing whatever... And these cats can pick up, boom, like, I know this mouse is there. You know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go look for that mouse. And sure, maybe it's not super extravagant. And maybe it does fit into like just the need to eat that we're talking about with the reptile brain, right? Quote unquote. But um, I don't know, to me, that's, that's a form of intelligence, right? How about uh, dogs? And I know, you know, of course, I wasn't there when this thing happened, but there is a famous story about a dog that that sniffed something wrong with their owner and they were behaving very, uh, very differently than usual. And it turned out that the dog's owner had cancer. Um, I don't know if dogs can sniff for cancer, right? But you see dogs when they encounter even a new person, immediately they're they're understanding the energy. I grew up with a German Shepherd and, you know, when someone was just coming to visit or something like that, the dog remained calm. And when there, a vehicle that we didn't really know showed up to the house, then he he was, you know, more defensive over us, more protective. And if you're saying that that's not intelligence, I mean... To me, you're wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like, when something has to live in the wild, you need a specific level of intelligence. I think humans are definitely getting smarter in in many ways, but we are losing a lot of this natural intelligence, I feel like. You know what I mean? Um, you can throw a reptile outside in Florida and it'll figure out how to live. Throw... Uh, you know, maybe a, a juvenile child into the Everglades, I don't know if they'll live, right? But now let's bring things back to reptiles, because this is the Primates with Reptiles podcast, not the Mammals with Mammals podcast. So there are many examples of what seem to me, you can disagree if you want, I mean, comment, let's, let's start a discussion about this, because, um, I mean, I, w I would like to know, and we're not going to get to the bottom of anything right now. And the more we talk about it, the better it is. But, so in general, let's talk about most of the reptiles that will lay eggs or, or have babies. You know, boas give live birth. But they kind of, they just go. They just go and they can do it, you know? Uh, the human brain grew a lot, so we can no longer do that. Because the babies had to come out a lot earlier to compensate for how big their head is or else they're never going to make it out in the world. But many reptiles are just out of the box and and living. Now, sure, this can be kind of described by the idea of the reptile brain. Again, this is the reptile brain is incorrect. We do not have a reptile brain. Reptiles have reptile brains that are more complex than what is thought about with uh, the idea of the reptile brain. But so, what about things like prickly geckos? You know, I have a couple prickly geckos, and I love them so very much. These adorable little geckos, they only get about four inches long. Now, this species does something pretty interesting. It's not 100% uh, unique in the reptile world, but uh, it's very interesting. The whole species is female, so... There's only one way to reproduce, and that's parthenogenesis, which is, it's not exactly cloning or, or like, you know, splitting, like maybe some uh, 
single-celled organisms do to create more organisms. But they have babies by themselves. And I don't care how smart the smartest lady you ever met was, human lady. She's not going to have kids by herself. And that's one of those things that we don't do. So we don't think of it as uh, this is a smart thing that smart people do. So it's smart if an animal does it. But it's pretty interesting how the species as a whole knows that they have to do it themselves. And they do it, right? I don't know how much they think about it. But, you know, maybe we should take the idea of intelligence away from of just thought, right? Maybe consciousness and intelligence are two different things, and, and maybe that's a topic for later on. But with these prickly geckos, they do a couple of other things. Now, many geckos, when they go to strike food, their tail kind of vibrates at the end. I don't know if this is excitement or, or what this is, but prickly geckos do something seemingly pretty unique, or at least rare. And... So if I'm feeding my prickly geckos and I toss some fruit flies in there, they'll take a bite, right? Well, let's say one, I have two of them in there. One of them takes a bite. Almost immediately after taking this bite, there is a distinct, slow, big, tall tail wag. When you're a four-inch gecko, you kind of want to stay under the radar, you know? If I'm wagging my tail around and I'm four inches long, a lot of things that are bigger can then see me and, you know, maybe eat me. Probably eat me, especially if they're Australian. Australia's a dangerous place when you're a little animal. But they do this, they do this wag, and it's thought to be signaling. It's thought that they're saying like, oh, hey, my friends, all the little, you know, clones, I'm going to use the word clone because it's easier, but they're not really clones. All you other clones that are just like me, the food's over here. And again, I don't know if they're thinking about it, but how interesting is it? And the species wants to survive because that's what species want to do, right? That's why uh, there are such positive reward systems for, you know, the act of, of reproducing. So maybe it's just the idea that the species wants to live on. This is a good way. If one little baby eats and it tells all the other ones, hey, the food's over here, we can live longer. And the, the adult females or, you know, the adult prickly geckos are all female. They can even do things like herding food towards their babies to encourage you know, that their babies eat to make more certain that their babies will eat. It, that's impressive. Whether they're consciously thinking, hey, you know, I have to do this now. So my, you know, babies, uh, Samantha and uh, Agnes can eat their food and everything's going to be good. I don't know if they're thinking about it that way. But again, maybe intelligence and consciousness are different. And if, if, them doing things like that, prickly geckos doing things like that, is not an example of intelligence. I don't know what is. Because 2 plus 2 is cool, right? We can do things like that. But, you know, it seems that some people struggle to make sure that their, their babies can eat. Some human people, you know? And these little things that are... So if we're talking about brain size, I mean, I don't know. But imagine a four inch long gecko where a lot of its tail, a lot of that four inches is tail. Imagine how small their brain is. And they can pull things like this off. Again, reptiles do have a cerebral cortex. It's not developed like ours is. But uh, I don't think it's fair to say that these are not intelligent animals. Let's talk about a couple other examples I like of just some really cool stuff that reptiles can do. Now, whether you love them or hate them, Chandler's Wildlife is a big creator on YouTube. He got this, he got this crocodile, Chinese, or no, sorry, Chinese, I think it is a Chinese crocodile, and I'm not sure exactly about the species. Its name is Nadia. He got it and then was trying to feed it. And this thing was hungry, right? Think about 
You know, people love to think crocodiles are these monsters that are just going to immediately bite you and eat you. Well, Chandler had food for it, and it was it was coming up to, to receive the food. Let's say it like that. Now, allow me to get where I was going with this. Chandler, it only took a few goes, or unless he's a very good editor, but everything seemed to be going in sequence. After a couple goes, the crocodile learned that, oh, he's telling me to stop and wait for the food. Okay, I will do that. I will come up to him, I'll stop, and I will wait to receive the food. In a couple goes. I mean, look, even if that took a couple days, that's pretty impressive for what we think of this water dragon that wants to absolutely demolish all of humankind. They can learn commands, audible commands. What about, let's go to another gecko, toke geckos. Toke geckos, and do this thing that is, again, not unique, but quite rare for reptiles. And people think of toke geckos as these mean, like crazy things, and they're not thinking, they're just being very defensive all the time and things like that. When a female toke gecko lays eggs, the male sticks around too. And they'll do this pretty cool thing where the male, let's just say, right, I'm starting with the male, the male goes and gets the food, female keeps an eye on the eggs. Well, Big Daddy gets nice and full off eating whatever the toke geckos are eating out in the wild. And then he comes back and mom goes for a meal. So, again, I don't know if they're thinking about it, but they have the intelligence to know, okay, well, we both have to eat and we need to make sure that these eggs hatch. So how are we gonna do this? And they develop a, a system. One that gets me all the time, because people think about venomous snakes as being like mean, evil, conscienceless things. Female king cobras, let me back up a little bit. Many snakes, conquer burrows of other burrowing animals which is also i think intelligent right why am i gonna i have no arms and no legs i am noodle let me figure out a way to find a good hiding spot well something else probably already made a hiding spot and i'm gonna jack it i'm gonna gta that bad boy all right but female king cobras without arms or legs right they build nests, complex nests for their eggs. Big old nests. They do this crazy thing where they're just like scooping, you know, they're using their body to just like scoop up leaves and sticks and build it into this elaborate mound that they then defend. You know, these are things that if they just wanted to eat, right? If they just wanted to eat and they just wanted to not be eaten, eaten there are simpler ways to go about that, you know? Uh, you hide, right? You run around, find food. But these two things alone, hiding and running around to fi find food, don't register to me as intelligence, right? You add these tasks, dare I say? You add these tasks in... And you realize that these animals are doing things that that take intelligence. You know, these aren't things... If, if the king cobra just wanted to eat and not be eaten, then they would just go crazy chasing food. And then when they see something big, they would hide. Or they would lay their eggs in like a little hole that again something else like other snakes do maybe are a rodent burrow they go smoke all the rodents and then leave their eggs in there or they'll hide in in just these burrows but it seems like it seems to me anyway that there is a little bit more going on than that so this idea brings me to what might make Probably most reptile keepers, and I am included in this, uh, being that my enclosures are not perfect or what they I want them to be for my animals. So if they're not just eating and trying to not get eaten, what does that mean for keeping a reptile in an enclosure in general, right? Let alone, and I was going to say rack keeping, and maybe... <laughs> 
maybe especially large scale rack keeping. But also, I mean, even like a decked out four foot by two foot by two foot enclosure for a bearded dragon, which is like kind of the new normal, thankfully. Thankfully, 40 gallon enclosures are not uh, known or recommended really as much, at least. But if they're smart, at least somewhat, and we're keeping them in boxes, and that's what we do. Obviously, I want to be very clear, I am not saying that there's probably no way to keep reptiles well, and we shouldn't keep reptiles. That's not what I'm saying. But, and that brings us kind of to rack keeping, you know, Ruby is a, about a four and a half, four and a half foot snake. So if I put her in a tiny little tub, you know, maybe six inches high or so, and not even her length long, or not even her length really, when you add the length to the width of the tub. They seem to do okay. Absolutely. I mean, I there are plenty of people that keep snakes in, in racks like this. But when you consider, right, because now we know the reptile brain is like debunked, because like I said, we didn't come from reptiles. And the reptiles have these parts of their brains. They're just less developed. You know, how can we justify rack keeping or keeping in too small of an enclosure? And again, you know, I'm not, I'm not innocent. Uh, I got into the reptile world fairly recently uh, outside of just being interested. I've been interested my whole life. But, you know, this is a, I feel like this is an important step for us all as reptile keepers to, to be better. Cause why would you, what, would you rather be better or worse? Let me ask you, would you rather be, you know, I know the answer. We'd rather do things better. Better doesn't mean quicker. Better doesn't mean cheaper. Better doesn't necessarily mean easier, but we should do better. You know, once you start thinking about these things as thinking feeling creatures it should start to kind of worry you if you're keeping them in tiny racks or you know like i said i don't do a whole lot of rack keeping aside from some baby african fat-tailed geckos i bred that will find you know different homes hopefully better homes than a rack but it makes you think that all you know all those what I mean, I don't know if I could say millions, but tens of thousands of ball pythons that are housed in, in tiny little tubs and drawers kind of makes you cringe thinking about, well, if these are thinking animals, and they are. It's fair to say. It's fair to say that they are thinking animals at some level. Again, dude, you know, I can't talk. I wish I could talk to Ruby. I can't. All right, I don't know exactly what she's thinking. But she's probably thinking. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's an animal. It's an animal bigger than an amoeba, you know? So, and maybe, hey, maybe, you know, there are some, like, small organisms that are smaller than some single-celled organisms that have nervous systems. So, you know, we don't know how their brains register pain, uh, if they do. But they can feel, right? That's what the nervous system is. And, you know, I, I promise you your snake has a, has a nervous system or your lizard. So, you know, it should make us question whether or not it's right to keep on, on a larger, not on a larger scale. Because keeping them in larger enclosures is better. But keeping on a, you know, trying to see how many things you could squeeze into one spot is probably not the best way to keep reptiles. On to what seems to me to be the next step of this discussion. Because, again, supposedly for a long time, people thought reptiles weren't really thinking. They're eating, they're sleeping, they're trying to breed maybe, and that's about it. And they're trying not to get killed. And, you know, it's good that... Look, nature is, nature is a dangerous place, Okay. Nature is, it's monster soup out there. So, I mean, it's that if you want to at least, you know, if you're worried about, oh no, I'm keeping my, you know, because of this podcast, I'm keeping in a small enclosure or whatever. 
it is nice that they don't have to worry about being eaten. That is a very good thing. And that's why I don't think, especially with captive bred animals, that it's, you know, in, inherently wrong to keep reptiles. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep keeping reptiles, you know, unless someone develops a device that you can, like, strap to them, and then English words translating their thoughts come out, and it's like, please never do this again, then, you know, maybe, you know, if it's coming straight from the horse's mouth, you know what I'm saying, Ruby? But the next step of this, because another idea that people had for a long time is your reptile, you can never bond with your reptile. You can make any efforts you want and they might recognize you as a food source and realize you're not trying to kill them and mellow out that way, but they will never, ever, ever be able to bond with you. I don't know if that's true. I And I'm saying I don't know because I don't know if I've successfully had any of my reptiles bond like truly bond you know again uh they know i bring them food and they get excited about food okay yeah most things do i mean you can lock a human in a, in a very small room you toss food at it it gets happy when the food comes around you know but can they bond there's also this idea too that they're like super territorial and they can never be kept in groups you can never keep two reptiles together and i don't think that you should have willy-nilly that's not what i'm saying but some species exhibit social tendencies i mean the prickly geckos i was talking about garter snakes very common snake but they seem to do better in groups and the fact that some of these reptiles can do well in groups tells me that there has to be some sort of you know, I don't know if they have a hierarchy like dogs do, but there has to be some sort of, uh, and not banter in word form, but a little bit of a little bit of play off each other, right? A little bit of socialization. And, you know, I heard this on the Animals at Home podcast on the round table about cohabiting reptiles, is that they seem to like observe each other for for different knowledge, you know, different ways to do things you know one animal starts doing something the other ones will try it out like oh maybe that, maybe that's a good idea to do it and you know that's kind of monkey see monkey do but there's also evidence of reptiles like that are being kept in a group finding their favorite companion you know like uh, their best friend so to speak and they'll like pick that one over other members of the species, you know, even if they're all in the same species, all living in the same house, same house, same enclosure, whatever you want to call it. But that alone at least makes me think that everyone who says your reptile cannot bond with you makes me think that that's wrong, saying it cannot. Will it? Okay, I don't know. You know, I mean, maybe you just, you ain't got the sauce like that. You know, maybe Ruby really doesn't like me that much and she'll never bond with me. But bonding, again, that's going to be on a person, on, well, person, the person, primate to reptile basis, right? An individual basis. Um, I think Bartaby, our bearded dragon, has bonded to us. She also, out of the box, is like the most calm. So like, she gave her, you know, instead of panicking and, you know, getting to that fight or, f fight or flight response, which is part of every brain, but not the only part of a reptile brain. So she was calm. She was able to realize, you know, since she was so calm, she could realize that we weren't trying to kill her quicker, you know, than some things that are get straight to that panic mode and then they can't process. But I think Bart would be bonded to us. You know, we walk in the room... And she doesn't get fed every single day. So I don't think it's just that she wants food, but she'll come down and be like, hey, you know, what are you guys up to? Same with Leroy, our tortoise does does a similar thing. Our corn snake. And they know they don't eat all the time, but they seem to... I don't know, I'm going to try to say this as clean as possible so nobody gets mad. Seem to show some level of concern. And concern not in the bad way, but just, you know, like this event of us walking and concerns them in some way. And it's not always for food too, because Stevie, who is always very hungry, she'll come out of the cage, but just kind of like calmly crawl instead of 
striking at the first warm thing that goes near her face. So I want to say that I can't, obviously I can't prove that rep, your reptile can bond with you, but familiarity is a thing. And they can become familiar. And is it, doesn't that go further than the idea of the reptile brain? So it's not only, I know you bring me food, and it's not only, I know you won't kill me, but it's like, hey, I know that guy. You know, I hand my reptiles off to my friends that they the reptiles have never met before. And it seems that they know, you know, maybe a little more tension than when I'm holding them. They're like, oh, okay, like this is new, you know. They, again, they know that they never get brutally murdered when they're out of their enclosure. So maybe they know they're safe, but they're kind of like, okay, I don't know this smell or I don't know you know, the the feel, maybe I, I hold them differently than people who haven't held reptiles before hold them. But this concept of familiarity seems to be at play, at the very least. So this all sounds pretty doomsday, kind of sounds like I'm saying we shouldn't be keeping reptiles. That's not what I'm saying. Because again, you can fulfill their basic needs, which is part of everyone's brain, not just reptiles, which uh, is good. Especially, again, for captive bred animals that would probably die going out in the wild anyway because they don't know how to deal with that, deal with the wild. But there are things we can do to um, offset this. Because, again, guys, you know, I am talking about them as, as smart beasts, and I think they are. But, like, I don't think it's the same... Even if the enclosure is small, I, I don't think it's the same as if you, like, locked a person in a bathroom, you know? Or even, like, you know, for example, chimps, chimpanzees will, you can kind of, like, you know, people have put them in zoos and stuff, and they kind of start going, like, a little bit ballistic, you know what I mean? It would be like a person in solitary confinement wants to get out. And, you know, I do think we have more complex thought, not than any animal, but than many animals. I mean, octopus and dolphins are two of them that, that kind of get me. You know, we don't know what the heck is going on in their brains. And they very well might be a lot smarter than us. They just don't speak English. But when, uh, when talking about a reptile, they, you know, you can keep them in a, in a small tub and, and they'll live and they'll eat and they'll you know, I'm not going to say thrive, but definitely survive and, and seemingly not tweak out in any way that we can conceive. So I do think they are still more low maintenance. Than a dog too, dude, you can put a dog in a crate and it's going to go, it's going to go nuts eventually, right? It's going to try to, it's going to bust its teeth up, trying to shred that crate up over, you know, X amount of time. So reptiles don't seem to do that. Which is good for uh, reptile keepers if you're trying to defend reptile keeping. But we have to be careful because you do have a living, thinking, feeling creature that I love you so much, Ruby, my, my, my beautiful red snake here. So I was going to say it's important to go above and beyond, but that's kind of the whole point. You know, the highest end of, like, enrichment activities and, and handling sessions, much like this. What it seems to be above and beyond compared to maybe the vast majority. But it's something we should do. We all should do it. Guys, throw something new in there for a smell. Take them out, let them roam around for a little while. Things like this, uh, at least periodically, if not often... You know, these things can improve the quality of life of a thinking, feeling being. You know, um, again, if you were locked in solitary confinement, maybe you do fine. You know what I mean? Maybe you got the, the, the brain for it, the mental fortitude for it. But I'll tell you what, it's probably, I don't care who you are. It's probably nice to get out of a solitary confinement type situation and, and you know, shoot some hoops, whatever, you know, play cards something some kind of just like oh okay this is a new thing or even just like you know if someone threw a ball into your your cell well now at least you have something to pass the time and i feel like that's that's lost in these in these um more sterile setups i think loose substrate guys is 
people will get mad and if you don't think you can do it safely if you don't think you can maintain temperatures safely you know i guess don't do it but paper towel or newspaper underneath uh, this animal or an animal like this it seems kind of like a padded room to me you know um you need natural you need you need something to pass the time even if it's some dirt to smell or kind of dig yourself into you know so I do think that the, the the reptile brain is a fake idea. But that being said, just because they're not as simple as maybe once thought doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep them. It's just that we should do our dil, dil, dil diligence. We should do our due diligence to make sure we're doing, you know, at least something to benefit the animal and not just to benefit us. You know, that's the thing with like, you know, morph breeding these days and everybody wants to get these fancy, you know, produce 500 ball pythons a year. And it's like, you know, what about, uh, what about the interaction? You know, that's, that's what I like the most, honestly. I mean, I think some animals look amazing. I'm not going to take anything away from that. But what about the interaction with the animal? You know, like, like, you know, let the, watch the animal think, watch the animal smell things, watch the animal do what the animal does, you know? So guys, enrichment is going to be very important for any, any animal. I mean, you know, cats and dogs too. Do more mental enrichment for them than is what is told, you know, like, okay, you have to do at least this, you know, do more than that guys. Come on. I mean, it's a, it's a living thing. You would want more done for you. And I don't think, you know, some people are going to be like, this is crazy that this guy is talking about reptiles like this, but what's the downside? A little bit of your time, maybe a little bit of money to set things up a little different. I mean, you signed up for a living thing, right? I mean, it's not it's not Ruby's fault she has to live with me, right? So I should do at least a little bit more than what is, you know, scraping scraping the barrel of what's good enough for Ruby. Now, like I said, and we're going to finish on this, Ruby is a wild animal. Ruby was harvested from the Solomon Islands. So it's weird that she's a pet in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan now. It, it's absolutely strange. But here's the thing about Ruby. Ruby is quite a large Solomon Island ground boa, which, you know, is no guarantee. And also her battle scars all over her tell me that she's probably relatively old. So, I mean, I'm just going to throw out a number. I mean, it's a, it's a guess that I have. This is like a 20-year-old animal. You know, roughly. Similar age to me. Um, it, based on the fact, again, that it's quite big and it has a lot of uh, former wounds, what are now scars on it. Are you going to seriously tell me? Or anybody? You know, I don't care. I don't care. You tell me whatever you want. I'm just saying. Are you going to go out of your way to say... That for 20 years, te fine, 10 years, whatever you want to say, for a decade or decades, this thing simply slithered around the floor of the Solomon Islands with no thoughts in its head. No, zero thought. Seriously, just, I smell this, and now I'm going to go eat that, or, oh, that looks scary, and I'm going to get away from that. Are you ta really, hold on, are you really telling me that those are the only two things that this animal thought of for 10 plus years? To me, guys, that is, that is bananas. Because think about the thoughts in your head and, okay, fine, say it, we're more complex, our brains are more complex than, than these guys' brains. You know, they are structurally. I mean, I don't know what goes through other animals' brains. I've only ever been a human, to my knowledge. But, think about the last five minutes. I mean, maybe even when you're listening to this, you're thinking about a million other things. So, it's, it's you know, this is like a clear example to me anyway. I, you know, I don't, I don't know nothing, dude. I don't know, I don't know nothing. But, to me, this seems pretty clear. That over the past 10 to 20 years or so, this animal has thought about more than I'm going to eat, I'm going to not get killed, you know. 
And oh, sure, you could say, oh, temperature and like whatever. That all that can be feel. But you know, Ruby was also gravid when she was imported, so maybe I don't know what that thought process is like when she's seeing a male. Maybe it's like, oh, what a handsome man. You know, maybe it's the snake version of that when she encountered that male that uh, impregnated her. So that thought experiment and uh, this episode of the show. You know, it's really a plea to, I mean, if you don't think that reptiles are intelligent at all, it's a plea to rethink that. And if you, you know, if you do think reptiles are intelligent and we're, you know, many of us that are maybe listening to this or many of us that keep reptiles do think that they're intelligent, but uh, it's not, not so much as, as a plea, but just another another reason why again myself included and others should be careful careful meaning take true care of the animal right not just clean the poop and feed it which is good keep doing that but you know why don't we find ways together as a as a team because this will make reptile keeping better as a whole which will make our reptiles happier as a whole which will make maybe says even society happier as a whole about people keeping reptiles and we won't have to go through you know the wave every so often where reptiles are gonna be banned blah you know you know maybe this is a way out of this cycle you know because honestly as a reptile lover and as someone who loves to keep reptiles i kind of understand when someone sees a wall of of i'm gonna keep saying ball pythons they're so commonly bred when people say a whole wall of ball pythons, it's like, that's wrong, kind of instinctually. And this is probably the right way around it, is to understand that even if they're not geniuses, even if they don't have human level consciousness, that these are intelligent things that ex experience, right? That's the very least, going back to Ruby's thought experiment, she's experienced, you know, what that means for her consciousness, I don't know. But these are things that take in experiences, so why not make those experiences as plentiful and as positive as possible? And I think that's what we need to do. I think that's what we need to do. And I think we got to get rid of that phrase reptile brain because for the reasons stated earlier on, it's bogus. It's not real. Uh, I wish I had a little lizard brain deep inside of my, uh, my human brain and I would call upon it to, uh, feel more like a lizard, but we don't have that ability because we don't have lizard brains. And if that makes you sad guys, I'm sorry, but that is going to wrap it up for today's episode. I'll stop being a bumbling ape and Ruby, uh, wants to go home. So guys, thank you so much for listening. Again, check out our YouTube channel, Red Ribbon Reptiles, videos every week. Now, two videos a week, including this podcast itself. If you came along for the ride, it means a lot to me. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you took a little bit today that can help you help out your reptiles as well. And that's what's important. But once again, I am Raph the Hominid. This is Ruby the Solomon Island Ground Boa. Thank you guys so much for listening to the Primates and Reptiles podcast. We'll see you next time.